Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all need saving. However, there's a widespread resistance to the thought that that's true for me. It's easy to see that the villains of history were sinners. You know, people like Nero or Hitler were tempted to disassociate from men like that. We say to ourselves, I don't commit murder or rape my neighbor's wife or rob old people of their savings or anything like that. I'm as good as the next person. Trouble being, the next person is a sinner too. We both need saving. Neither of us loves God with all our hearts. Neither of us loves our neighbors as we love ourselves. If either of us were to stand there beside Jesus, the light of his goodness and love would reveal us as the self-absorbed miscreants that we are. We do need saving. Honestly, think about this. No one here can read your thoughts. But if they could, if what actually took place in your head somehow appeared on a big screen above you for everyone to read, you'd have to leave town. Any of us would. Hide, enter the witness protection program, something like that. Which is why Jesus came. He can read your thoughts, and he knows you need saving. On this night, we focus on his saving work. But the first step in having his work save us is to agree with him that we need it. In Paraguay, in the 1980s, a father who was a doctor spoke out against the military regime there and its human rights abuses. Local police took their revenge on him by arresting his teenage son and torturing him to death. Enraged townsfolk wanted to turn the boy's funeral into a protest march, but the doctor chose another means of protest. At the funeral, the father displayed his son's body as he had found it in the jail, naked, scarred from electric shocks and cigarette burns and beatings. All the villagers filed past the corpse, which lay not in a coffin, but on the blood-soaked mattress from the prison. It was the strongest protest imaginable, for it put injustice on grotesque display. And isn't that what God did at Calvary? The cross that held Jesus' body naked and marked with scars, exposed the kind of world we have. It revealed the true nature, magnitude, and effect of sin, of all sin, of your sin, my sin. Your sin is not a small thing. By it, you are coldly indifferent to what is good and right, and the crucifixion displays the effect of that. By sinning, we participate in injustice and in harm against others. And the crucifixion displays what that does. Every sin expresses contempt and antipathy toward God. The crucifixion reveals where that goes. Jesus, up on the cross, exposes for all to see what has come out of our hearts. But not only that, the cross also reveals something else. It reveals what kind of a God we have. He is a God of sacrificial love. Hebrews 10 verse 12 from our reading said, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He offered himself as a single sacrifice for sins, for the sins of the world. Why? in order to provide forgiveness. Someone will say, well, was all that really necessary? Couldn't, couldn't God just forgive? Couldn't he just say to everyone who's guilty, you're forgiven, and be done with it? Forgiven without the cross? No. And it's important that we're clear on this. See, anytime there is real forgiveness... Forgiveness that really brings healing and reconciliation. Anytime there is real forgiveness and not just shallow, pretend forgiveness. Anytime someone who has been hurt or offended really lets the one who hurt or offended them off the hook 
so that they're now free of any punishment or the threat of it, not even a grudge. Any time that happens for real, it costs something. True forgiveness does not come cheap. If I go over and punch someone in the nose, they're faced with a choice. They could say, I'm going to get you back. I'll make you pay for what you did to me. And then they flatten me and I'm on the floor. That would be simple justice. And it's one possibility. The relationship is over, but at least justice will have been served. However, if they're walking with the Lord, they might say, they might say, Neil, I forgive you. I forgive you. Now, when they say that, what did it cost them? Not nothing. It cost them a punch in the nose. They're, 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 they're not evening up the score. They're one-sidedly letting the pain, the cost of keeping the relationship, relationship going, fall on themselves. They take the punch and give me the forgiveness. Don't say that didn't cost them. They sacrificed. They sacrificed their nose to offer me that forgiveness. When you look at Christ crucified, you are seeing God's sacrifice of himself to pay for the evil that your sin and mine has done. Why? Why would he do that? So that by forgiveness, he can have not you punished. It's not what he wants. It's what you deserve, what I deserve. It's not what he wants. So that he can have not you punished, but have you in an unencumbered relationship with himself. God loves you and sacrifices for the sake of that relationship he wants with you. Now, I think looking around, most of you are parents and understand this kind of love firsthand. How so? Because when children are in need, a mother or father is moved to help, even to sacrifice for them. It's a built-in feature of parenting. Children come into the world completely dependent. They cannot grow to operate as self-sufficient, independent agents unless their parents give up a lot. Unless for years, their parents sacrifice much, much of their own independence and freedom for the kids. If you don't allow your kids to intrude on your freedom in work and in play at all, if you don't regularly let them hinder it, if you only get to your kids when it's convenient for you, oh, they grow up, but only physically. In all sorts of other ways, they remain emotionally needy, troubled, and over-dependent. Choice then is clear. You can either sacrifice your freedom or theirs. It's them or you. Here's where I'm going with this. God, like a father or mother, looks at us and he sees that we are all in huge need. We've, we've got a rap sheet, a shocking record of sins, what we've done and what we failed to do. Furthermore, we're still under the destructive influence of those sins and flattened by the weight of their guilt also intimidated by approaching death, as well as final judgment and hell. Our condition and need is desperate. God sees this and says, well, it's them or me, and it'll be me. It'll be me. I'll do for them what they cannot do for themselves. So like a loving parent for his children, God sacrifices himself. And Christ says, what's the tally of their sins? Put the whole record against my name and get it off of theirs. I give my body and my blood to substitute for them. I take their guilt, their death, their shame, their hell. I take it on the cross. I take it all for them because I want them freed, really forgiven, fully alive and at ease in a relationship with me and without me making this costly sacrifice in their place. That can't happen. So the Father sent the Son, and Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. That's what we are beholding when we look to him on the cross. And after that was finished, 
It says in Hebrews 10 verse 12, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. This is telescoping events a little bit because in fact it was 43 days after his crucifixion and also after his resurrection that Christ ascended and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Being seated in this way tells us very important things. First, that Jesus' work is done. He sat down because it's done. It's completely finished. No loose ends remaining. Nothing still to be added for the forgiveness of sins. Nothing to be added. Not by him, not by you, not by anyone. Now, in contrast, the Old Testament priests stood daily making endless animal sacrifices. There were not even chairs in the temple because their work was never done. But Christ was seated next to the Father in heaven because the single sacrifice of his divine self took away all sins ever done. It was perfectly complete and eternally effective. The second thing communicated by Christ being seated is that God is satisfied with his sacrifice. That is, God in heaven accepts and approves of it. And thus, he honors his son, giving him the high throne at, the, at his right hand in glory. God is super pleased with what Jesus has accomplished. Happily, fully satisfied by Christ's work. And since Christ's work was in order to save you, it means that when you trust in Christ's work, God is happily fully satisfied with you. Believe this and cheer up. God is happily, fully satisfied with you. Look, look at Hebrews 10 verse 14. It goes on. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now the single offering here refers, of course, to Christ crucified. And by this offering, the scripture says, God has perfected those who are being sanctified. Now you go, well, who is this talking about? Me and you. It says that we're now being sanctified. Sanctified comes from a word in Latin, you know, sanct sanctus, it means holy, okay? We're being sanctified. We're gradually being, being made godly, being made holy. It's a process taking place in, in all who truly believe. Because what's happening? What does this process look like? We're learning not just to continue charging along in sin, denying it and blaming it on others. We're learning not to do that at all. We're learning to actually notice our sins and repent of them and then to choose God's way. We're learning to do this more and more. We're slowly learning new habits of, of listening to God and relying on God. And we're becoming more and more active in doing the works he gives us to do, good works. The word for all that kind of a thing is sanctified. It's a process that will develop in us throughout our lives. But that's not the only word in verse 14. There's also the word perfected. It says that by Christ's offering, we've been perfected. Not will be perfected, have been. Unlike sanctification, this is not an ongoing process. This has already happened. You believe in Christ, you trust in his work, there you are. You have been perfected. <laughs> no, I have not, you say. I know me. I'm very conscious of certain failings. There's no way I've been perfected. And my husband certainly hasn't. <laughs> Are you going to argue with the Bible? Let me explain this. Now that you have faith, now that you've been baptized, God no longer regards you by yourself anymore. He, he no, 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 no longer regards you as just you. No, you're now included in Christ Jesus, in God's Son. That means that when God looks at you, he does not see your sins. He does not gaze upon them angrily but he sees the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and that you, you being in him, 
all your sins were finally and completely dealt with by that cross. You're in Christ. When God looks at you now, he sees the righteousness of Jesus, his son. You are included in that as though you had done all the good that he's done. In short, in God's eyes, you're a joy. You're beloved. You're favored. There's no sense that he'd love you more if you were better or that he'd be better pleased with you if you just pull your act together. No. In Christ, because you are in Christ. You lack nothing. You are complete in God's eyes. He's not noticing your stains and flaws which make you hang your head when you're around God. No. He's seeing that you are in Jesus. And so to him, you are perfect. That's the word in verse 14, perfected. That's you, made complete, perfected by by your own efforts. No, by the single offering of Christ on the cross. Therefore, you may hold up your head. what God wants to see you do. Hold up your head without shame when you're with him and feel happy in his presence. For by a single offering, you have been perfected for all time. I'm going to finish with a story. A nun once confessed to her bishop that Christ had revealed himself to her in person. The bishop was surprised. But he knew this nun and the deep walk she had with the Lord, so he said to her, look, the next time he reveals himself to you in person, ask him about the sins of the archbishop, because I'd like to know some of the bad things that he's been doing. Because uh, he was her confessor, the nun said that she would act in obedience and do exactly that. A number of weeks later, she came back. The bishop said, well, did he reveal himself to you? She said, yes. Did you do what I told you to do? Did you ask about the sins of the archbishop? She said, yes, I did. The bishop said, well, what did he say? The nun replied, he said, I don't remember. Indeed, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Amen. Now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.